Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the analyst of agronomy, the Houdini of horticulture, that physicist of farming, and the wizard of Wisconsin, Professor Clint Sprott. <laughs> Welcome to the Wonders of Physics. Now this is the year of the Wisconsin idea at the University of Wisconsin. The Wisconsin idea is that the boundaries of the university are the boundaries of the state. Or more generally, that the research we do at the university should have broad application to society. An example is the weather. We can make accurate predictions of the weather because of all the detailed physics that is in the models that the weather people use to make predictions. We can even predict when and where a tornado is likely to occur. Would you like to see me make a tornado? I thought so. For this, I will need a volunteer. OK, come down here. And what is your name? My name is Melissa. Oh, hi, Melissa. Uh, where are you from, Melissa? I'm from Chicago. Melissa from Chicago. Do they have tornadoes down there? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Have you ever seen one? No. OK, well, we're going to show you a tornado today. And you know, tornadoes usually occur in the summer. They require some heat. So I'm going to make some heat. And to do that, I'm going to wad up this little uh, paper towel. I'm going to put it in this can. And then I'm going to take some lighter fluid. And I'll soak the paper with the lighter fluid. And what I would like you to do, Melissa, is take this and set that on fire for me. Now, of course, you know hot air rises. And as the air rises, cold air has to come in from below. And if the cold air coming in is rotating, then as it comes in closer and closer to the center of rotation, it goes faster and faster. And it's much like an ice skater you've probably seen that spins around and brings her arms in and goes really fast. Now, Melissa, could you take this and put that out for me? Okay. I think I'm in Wisconsin anymore. Um, excuse me, where am I? Why, wow, you're in the wonderful land of physics, of course. The land of physics? Yes. How am I going to get home? Home? Where's home? Chicago. Chicago. Hmm. Well, I have an idea of how we can get you back home. Uh, maybe we can use some balloons. I've, you know, I've been experimenting with them. What do you think would happen if we were to light a hydrogen balloon on fire? Well, what do you think would happen if we lit 10 hydrogen balloons on fire. <laughs> well, you know, if loud noises bother you, you uh, you're going to want to plug your ears. And you know, I'm really fond of my beard here, so I've got a little bit of added protection I'm going to put on. <laughs> and again, we will uh, light our match on the stick. There we go. Okay, now this is going to be loud, so. Oh, good, got that one too. All right. Now, you know, maybe a hydrogen balloon is not the way that we're going to send you home. I, uh, I know of a person who can help you out, though, and that's the Wizard of Whisk. Uh, he's a big Green Bay Packers fan and a real cheesehead. And he lives in the city of green and gold. And what you'll have to do is follow the yellow cheese road and learn some physics on the way. So off you go. Wish me luck. I'll need it. Now, transportation is an area that physics has greatly influenced over the recent years. In fact, Wisconsin has played first to many of the uh, advances in transportation. We've had the first city-to-city uh, -city auto race, the first snowmobile, and the first outboard engine. And here to tell us more about physics and transportation is our own king of transportation, Mike Randall. <laughs> If I, if I were king, just king, 
Physics is a part of everyday life. It's a study of how things push and pull on each other, how things exchange energy, how things move. To get something moving, you have to push or pull on it. Physicists call that a force. Now, my favorite dead guy, Sir Isaac Newton, came up with three rules about how to move things around. It's called his three laws of motion. Have you heard of them? Have you heard of them? Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe some people haven't. I need three volunteers from the audience. We're going to demonstrate this. OK, you, sir, in the red jacket right there. Uh, let's see here. You, young lady, right there in the pink stripes. And you, sir, that'll do just fine. What is your name? Abraham. Abraham. Let's see, Abraham, and you are? Blake. Abraham and Blake, I have a special job for you. I'm going to have you guys sit right on that board for me. Please sit cross-legged and face the crowd. What is your name? Lexi. Lexi. You get to hold on to that. OK. These guys are playing the role of two large Wisconsin cheese wheels today. <laughs> we are in Wisconsin. Now, you are all playing the role of scientists, which means you're all observing right now. I want you to observe our two cheese wheels. What are they doing? They're just sitting there, not doing anything. Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion says that an object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. Lexi, you get to be the outside force. I want you to pull on that rope, and let's see what happens. <laughs> Anytime. Go ahead, sir. Oh, dear. Uh, how's that going? It's really hard. Well, you know, well, hang on a second. So you can stop pulling. I think the problem is there's too much friction between the bottom of that board and the floor. Do you know what friction is? Yeah. Well, I think there might be some people who don't know. So we're all going to try this out. Put your hands together for me and rub. What do you notice? It's getting hotter. Ah, yes. See, friction is a force that turns the energy of motion, or kinetic energy, as scientists call it, into heat energy. Now, throughout history, people have been looking for ways to reduce friction, to make transportation easier. OK, guys, I need you to stand up and pick that board up for me. In ancient times, people used rollers to help reduce friction. So we're going to try some rollers out here. OK, set the board right back down on there. And go ahead and sit on the board again, just like you did before. Face the front of the room. OK. Lexi, hang on to that for a second. Now, I also want you guys to put your arms like this. Excellent. OK, Lexi, give it another try. Pull, pull, pull. Go, 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 go. Ah. Now, how was that? Was that easier? Yeah. Yeah, those rollers did a great job to reduce the friction, made tra transporting these cheese wheels a lot easier, right? Excellent job. Big round of applause for my three helpers here. Oh, oh, you scared the daylights out of me. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, it, it's not your fault. It, sometimes we physicists just get you know, wrapped up in our thoughts. My name's Mike Randall. Who are you? Uh, my name's Melissa, and I'm trying to find the Wizard of Whisk. Oh, the, I know the wizard. Uh, he's an airplane pilot. Have you tried looking for him in an airport? Uh, uh. No, but I've been walking for hours, and I think I twisted my ankle in the Swiss cheese a little bit ago. Oh, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, is there an easier way I can get there? Well. I have been working on another type of transportation, another way to reduce friction. Uh, this is called a hovercraft. This, this uses a, uh, a thin cushion of air to, to lift the board up a little bit. It greatly reduces friction, but I've been too cowardly to try it. Oh, I'm not scared at all. This will get me to the city in no time. Really? Oh, yeah. OK, well, <laughs> we'll give it a try here. Well, I guess physics isn't a substitute for driving lessons. Well, there have been many pioneering environmental ideas uh, recently. And here at UW-Madison, we've had the very first Department of Limnology, which is the study of freshwater lakes. And also John Muir, a very famous conservationist and father of our national park system, attended the UW-Madison. 
And here to tell us more about physics and the environment is our own biodegradable and environmentally friendly, Marty Lickman. Hello, everybody. Welcome. And I have a demonstration here that can show us how the greenhouse effect works. Now, we have two identical fish tanks. And before the show, I filled one with a dense gas called sulfur hexafluoride. It's clear, it's odorless, and it's non-toxic. But it's very dense, so it will stay in the tank. I had the cover on so only so that breezes wouldn't blow it out. This balloon is just filled with air. It will sink. And if I put it in this one, it sinks down, because this fish tank is just filled with air. But if I put it into this one, it will float, because the air in the balloon is lighter than the sulfur hexafluoride that it displaces. So let me set that aside, and I'm going to turn on two lamps to simulate the sun. And the light from the sun comes down, and it heats the dark earth at the bottom, which we've simulated using this cloth. That light is absorbed, and then it's actually re-emitted in infrared. And you might say, wait a minute, that the Earth is not glowing? That doesn't make sense? Ah, but it is, and you just can't see it. And I will show you exactly where that infrared radiation is using another device over here. We call this a carbon arc lamp. It's the same thing used in older lighthouses to make that bright white light. So I'm going to turn this on, and we will strike an arc, forming a plasma between two carbon electrodes making this bright white light. We'll shine that light on this quartz prism, refracting it out into the colors of the rainbow. Shine it on that white card, which we'll put up on the screen here. So you can see the rainbow shining on my card, and you can see a black dot in the middle. What that is is it's a sensor that detects optical power. And I can move that sensor back and forth to see how much power is in different parts of the rainbow. And we'll show the measurement on this galvanometer on the screen on your right over here. OK, so let me move it back and forth and see how much power is in different parts of the spectrum. You can see as I move it, it changes how much power there is. And let me try and find the peak. There's a big spike there. All right, it's pretty high right there. I think that's the peak. We've pegged the needle. It's way past 50. But now take a look at my rainbow. Anyone tell me which color we're on? Right here. Speak up. Well, it's pretty close to red, but I don't think it's on red. Anyone else have any guesses? Over there. No, violet's all the way on the other side. It looks to me like there isn't any light there at all. Actually, I don't see any. Do you guys? No. Well, ultraviolet is actually all the way at the other end of the spectrum. This is what we call infrared. And we call it infrared because it's a longer wavelength than red. Um, so it's past red when you refract the light out into a rainbow. But this, is, this shows that there really is light there. We just can't see it with our eyes. And in fact, there's quite a lot. Most of the optical power is falling there. So let's shut this off and go back to our suns. Take this away. Now, what's been going on here? Why did I fill one of the fish tanks with sulfur hexafluoride? Well, that visible light comes down. It's absorbed by the dark cloth. And then it's re-emitted as infrared. Air just passes the infrared, and most of it will come out. But sulfur hexafluoride is a greenhouse gas. And what that means is that it absorbs infrared radiation. So that infrared radiation gets trapped in the SF6, emitted back down to the cloth, back up, back down, and a lot of it stays in there. So the temperature in this fish tank should get hotter. But now, how can we actually see that? Because since we can't see infrared with our eyes. Well, I happen to have a camera which can see infrared radiation. So let's uh, get this out here and get that set up on the screen there. And hey, let's take a look at you guys first. <laughs> Give a wave. So what you're seeing on the screen there is the infrared radiation coming off of your bodies. All of you are glowing just at a wavelength that you can't see. In fact, anything that has some temperature will glow at some wavelength, just not necessarily one that you can see with your eyes. Well, let's take a look at our fish tanks and see what I, oh, hey, let's check this out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a geyser. <laughs> Actually, if we look at the geyser over here, you can see quite a lot of heat on the Bunsen burners at the bottom there, and then the heat traveling up the tube. There's hot water all in the tube there. But 
we're going to take a look at these fish tanks. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut off these lights so that they don't wash out my picture. But you can see if I look at the light, even though the light is off, it's still glowing because it's very hot. It's glowing in the infrared spectrum. But let me take a look at the fish tanks and see what we can see. Now, since I'm facing the other way from you, the one on the right is the one with the sulfur hexafluoride. You can see the red spot on the bottom there on the cloth. It has a much larger red spot than the one that had air in it. Red, is, uh, red and white are the hottest colors in this image. So the one with the sulfur hexafluoride, we can see after a few minutes, has already gotten quite a bit hotter. It's a small temperature difference, but after only a couple of minutes, it's still noticeable. And you can imagine what would happen um, if this process was repeated all day long, day after day after day. It would build up quite a bit. Now, uh, there's actually one, uh, well, I should mention that the reason we call it the greenhouse effect is it's an analogy to a garden greenhouse where you have glass that passes the visible light, the plants and whatever else is in the greenhouse absorbs that visible light, re-emits it as infrared radiation, but the glass traps that infrared radiation inside, making the greenhouse warmer um, than if the glass weren't there. But there's one other cool thing we can do with sulfur hexafluoride. Now, I wonder what would happen if I stick my head in and take a breath. Let's find out. Let the beat drop. <laughs> Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue. So the speed of sound in sulfur hexafluoride is only 44% of what it is in air. So when I breathe it in, I get long, longer wavelength resonances setting up in my nasal passages, making my voice seem to appear lower. Oh. Oh. Okay. I represent the <laughs> lollipop kids, the lollipop kids. <laughs> um, well, that, that must be helium in your balloon. It does quite the opposite of what SF6 does because it's a lighter gas. The speed of sound in helium is two and a half times higher oh. than in air, which makes it set up shorter wavelength resonances in your nasal passages. That's really interesting and all, but I'm actually trying to find the wizard of whisk. Oh, the wizard. Well, you know, so all this talk about greenhouse gases and SF6, SF6 is not usually one that we're concerned about because there's not much abundance of it in the environment. We're typically more concerned about methane and especially carbon dioxide. It's the carbon in the carbon dioxide, which is why we're all trying to lower our carbon footprints. Oh. The wizard of whisk is no exception. He rides his bike in order to try and lower his carbon footprint. Oh. There's a picture of it, actually. You know, and he also has a carbon, a carbon dioxide powered tricycle. Uh, it's this right here. It's his rocket tricycle, but it's powered by a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. I think he might be a little c confused about the whole carbon footprint because it actually emits quite a bit of carbon dioxide when we use it. But it's a rocket cycle, so it's quite fast, and I think it should take you to him in no time. Okay, uh, which way should I go? Oh, well, uh, I think it's that way, uh, or maybe that way. Oh. I don't know. Really but, helpful. Yeah, it's a little bit loud, so you in the front row might want to cover your ears. Good luck. <laughs> well, what's the difference between a magician and a physicist? A magician, you can't ever get him to tell his secrets. But a physicist, you can never get him to shut off. I think I've seen that somewhere out west. You know, energy is an area that has been greatly influenced by uh, our physics research. In fact, the Department of Energy funds many energy research programs here at the UW-Madison. Here to tell us more about energy and physics is our own energized and electrifying Kenny Rudinger. Where would we be without energy? Well, it would be very difficult for you to be here today because your cars wouldn't have had the energy to take you here. It would be difficult for you to sit here and watch because you wouldn't have gotten any energy from the food that you ate. Energy can take on many different forms, uh, and one of those forms is light. And we have some light bulbs here to uh, demonstrate that for us. So let's turn them on. Let's find a switch. That didn't do it. And other did that. Let's see. Hmm. Cable here. Where does that go? Oh, it goes to this bike. Well, a bicycle is a clever device uh, that you sit on and you pedal and uh, you turn a gear 
that uh, will then turn a wheel uh, to make to make you and the uh, bicycle move uh, uh, down down the street. So what we've done here is we have taken this bicycle and we have uh, taken the back wheel off and instead put a, a device uh, on it instead that we have plugged the light bulbs into. So to uh, demonstrate how this bicycle works, I need a volunteer who likes to ride bicycles. You, sir. Now, what is your name? Blake. Blake. All right, Blake. Why don't you sit on the bicycle and go ahead and start pedaling. <laughs> That's a lot of work, isn't it? But you're able to light the bulb. Yeah. Now, yeah. try again. So look at that. You're able to get a much brighter light, and it's not nearly as much work, is it? No. All right, well, thank you very much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. So what happened? Well, when he pedaled, I turned the gear, which then turned this device at the back of the bicycle. And what a hub dynamo does is it converts mechanical energy, that is the energy from pedaling, into electrical energy. And so that the electricity that is generated then goes and runs through one of the bulbs lighting it up. Now we have two different bulbs, uh, and we saw, so we saw the first bulb, an incandescent bulb, uh, required a lot and it didn't light up very much. The second bulb, the one on the right, is an LED or light emitting diode. And that one uh, didn't require nearly as much work and was very, very bright. And the reason for that is that these, uh, the incandescent bulbs, or these, these uh, older kinds of bulbs, are much less efficient at converting uh, energy, electrical energy, into light as opposed to these LEDs, which are much more efficient. So the LEDs will take much more of the energy that you put into it and, are, and convert that into light. And so that's why we're switching today from uh, old, L, uh, old incandescent bulbs into LEDs and compact fluorescent bulbs, saving us energy and money. Hello there. Um, my name is Melissa, and I'm trying to find the Wizard of Whisk. Uh, but I'm a little curious about what's going on with all these ping pong balls and mouse traps. Well, that's a great question. Let's take a look. So we're talking about energy, and we just saw with this bicycle uh, different forms of energy that you can have. And this is a demonstration of another kind of energy that you can have. Now, uh, before I explain exactly how this works, works, we need to talk about atoms. So you and me and everything around us, everything in the world, all the matter in the world is made up of atoms. And atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, if you take an atom and split it apart, you can release energy. And so only that is to hit it with a neutron. You hit an atom with a neutron, you split it apart, releasing energy, and sometimes other neutrons as well. Then those neutrons can hit other atoms, causing them to split apart, releasing more energy and more neutrons uh, in a process that's called a chain reaction. So this chain reaction is the process um, by which we get power at nuclear power plants. So when we split these atoms apart, this is a process called nuclear fission. And we have a chain reaction of them, then we can generate power. So this is uh, a model of that. Each mouse trap represents an atom, and each ping pong ball represents a neutron. So we're going to drop a ping pong ball in from the top. It's going to hit a mouse trap. It's going to make the mouse trap go off, which is going to send a ping pong ball flying. That's going to then hit another mouse trap. That's going to send its ping pong ball flying in a chain reaction, much like uh, the chain reaction that we have when there's nuclear fission going on at a power plant. So there's a string there. Take hold of that. And everybody watch very carefully. It's going to happen pretty quickly. So Melissa, go ahead and pull the string. So would everybody like to see that again? Yeah. All right, I'm going to need 200 volunteers to help me reset the traps. <laughs> On second thought, we can just uh, watch a video in slow motion that we made earlier. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Oh, yeah. So nuclear fission is one way that we can get energy from atoms, by splitting them apart. But there's another way, too, by bringing them together in a process called nuclear fusion. Now, the Wizard of Wisp worked on a nuclear fusion project right here at UW for over 25 years called the Madison Symmetric Taurus. If you're looking for him, look for a large aluminum donut, and he'll be sure to be nearby. All right, I'll try to keep an eye out for one of those things. Thanks.
Can you hear me now? 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 Oh, okay. How many of you remember a telephone that had a cord on it? Oh, maybe you still got some. Okay. How many have ever used a telephone with a dial on it? Well, there's a few hands. How many have used a telephone that's had a crank on the side? You had to crank it to use it. Oh, yeah. Maybe one, two, a couple. Okay, now how many of you have went down to the Western Union Telegraph office at the railroad station and sent a telegraph? <laughs> well, you know, nowadays most people, when they want to communicate, they just use cell phones and two-way radios. So communications is an area that physics greatly influences. And here to tell us more about that is our own 5G professor, Professor Michael Winokur. Oh, uh, I think he forgot again. Hang on a minute. Hey, Professor Winokur. Professor Winokur. Pete. Sorry, Pete. Pete. Oh, he'll get over it. So look what I found on the yellow cheese road. And I thought it appropriate that we should try to communicate with him and find out why he's here and what he's all about. You know, communication only involves manipulation of energy. So as a first attempt, I thought I'd try some directed energy from this Tesla coil and see if we could wake him up. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah? Now, I hope there's no equipment malfunction. But if there is, it's OK. My CPR is current and up to date. Down to the control panel. Are we ready for this? Yeah. Ah, oh, I needed that. It was all good. Hey, he talks. Now we can communicate. With all this energy, there's no way I'm going to stand here and talk. I got to go. That's pretty heartless of him. I heard that. You're right, so right for now, but not for long. Ah, I'm sure the Wizard of Whisk can fix him up with a nice new heart. But if he stayed, I could have told him that communication often involves energy in the forms of light or sound, two things which our Tesla coil seems to produce in rather large quantities. But we really, really need to control it better. In fact, we need to do three things. First, we need to use energy to create a disturbance. Then we have to send that disturbance, that signal, out over a distance. And more importantly, or most importantly, three, we have to maintain that signal even in the event that there is noise or interference. Perhaps some of you parents know a little bit about noise and interference. I think I'll talk about sound first. Now, sound uses the air molecules. We just have to impart some energy to them. To do that, I have a demonstration here that shows you how it works. We squeeze the air molecules together, and then we spread them apart. And we do that over and over again. Now, let's get this set up. I think that's set there. So here's a piston, sort of like your bicycle pump. When I push down on the plunger, the volume will get smaller. The molecules of air will move closer together. They're getting squeezed. The pressure will go up. When I lift up on the plunger, the air molecules will have more space, so the volume will increase, and the pressure will go down, and they will sort of be spread apart. To monitor that process, I have a gauge, a pressure gauge down here, and a computer readout up there. The display, the top one, gives you a number in units of kilopascals. I'm sure they'll live. Plus, there's a chart along the bottom for you to follow and see the graph of the pressure. So if I hit start, you see a number. And let's squeeze down and lift up and squeeze down and lift up. The pressure goes up. The pressure goes down, back and forth. Did you hear that? Yeah. No. You've got good ears. <laughs> For you to really hear that pulse, that I'd have to do this about 100 times a second. 
It's not going to happen, not today anyway. But now I have my disturbance. So now I have to send that energy out to you through the air. And I want to show you that, but it's hard to see the air. So we have another demonstration back here. It's just a simple device. It's a long coil of wire wrapped round and round and round and round. We have a fancy name for it. We call it a slinky. <laughs> but we're going to do what, we ha what happens in the air. There's a metal bar back here that's attached to the slinky. And when I pull it back, it will spread the coils of wire apart. When I let go, it will squeeze the co coils of wire together. And you'll see what happens to the energy in this disturbance when I let go. We all ready? Yeah. All right, watch carefully. <laughs> so this squeezing and spreading is happening in the air. And this special kind of wave, because the energy moves along the wave and the motion moves along the wave, is called a longitudinal wave. But we can actually visualize the motion of the air molecules with sound in this device. Just turn on the light over here. It's just a tube, sort of like a pipe organ tube. There's a speaker on the far end. And it will set up a standing wave in here. And with this standing wave, there'll be an interesting property. In the places where the pressure is high, the molecules are squeezed together, the air will be moving slowly. Where the pressure is low and the air molecules are far apart, they'll actually be moving very quickly. And we'll be able to visualize it because there's all this brown stuff on the bottom. Uh, there's some wine bottles that we had. We ground up the cork really fine so that uh, the dust is very um, powderly and light. And when I turn on the speaker and I turn on, and you'll be able to see the standing wave in the motion. So let's turn that on. Everybody hear that? Watch carefully. It moves quick here and not at all there and about two thirds of the way down. You ready? So that's. What's happening? In the airwaves as they move out to you. So we've got two of the three things. We've created the disturbance. We've sent the energy out to you. Now we want to maintain the signal in the event there's noise. Now for this last part, or this third part, I have a couple more demos. I need a volunteer, somebody close. You put up your hand. Come on out here. Your name is? Wyatt. So the Wizard of Whisk sent me a special message by the mail. And you're going to read. You can read, right? Oh, good, Wyatt. And you, all of you are going to participate because you're going to make some noise while he's reading the special message. And we'll see if someone in the back row can hear that message. You ready? Let me get the message out. Put that there. And everybody start making noise. <laughs> Okay, in the back row. Did anybody hear that? No. Okay. So now we're going to keep the signal together in such a way that maybe someone in the back row can hear it. We talked to our friends at Kraft and got the world's biggest cheese noodle. I think they got carried away with the orange food coloring. What do you think? And we're going to try that again. You're going to speak in here a little bit louder. And there's going to be a volunteer in the back row who's going to listen. Do we have a volunteer? All right, we're good. And you guys are going to make that noise again while Wyatt says the secret message. All right, go. <laughs> what did he say? I like physics. I like physics. I love physics. Cool. How many of you folks like physics? <laughs> Thank you, Wyatt, back there. The sound tube is a lot of fun. We leave it out after the show so the kids can have a good time with it. Now, sound is usually pretty good for communicating in the room, but it travels really too slow to, travel, to go long distances. If you think about it, a one-word conversation by cell phone to California, if you were to use sound energy, would take about four hours. Can you imagine what your cell phone bills would be like? 
Uh, yeah, I can. No, thank you very much. But we have other forms of energy. I happen to have a green light on top of my hat. And light energy travels at about a million times faster. So that means it takes almost no time at all. But we just have to control the sound in the same way. So back here, we have a demonstration that shows you how we're going to do that. We have a light pipe. And we're going to examine the physics of refraction, that's the bending of light, and reflection, like a mirror. But there's no mirror in this plastic rod. And we'll see what happens as I change the angle at which the light comes into one end of the plastic rod. So this is a green laser with a very special type of lens on it. And I'll come in from the bottom so it's perpendicular, and you can see the green light. Now, as I move the laser and bam, change the angle, the light bends more and more. That's refraction, but pretty soon it bounces in and out, back and forth. So I can maintain the light signal all the way to the end of the rod. So any of you who've used communications with fiber optics exploits physics in that way. But we're not just limited to sound or visible light. We can, in fact, transmit light of any energy, or almost energy, through space and distance. And we had so much fun with the Tesla coil, I'll show you that we can actually use it to transmit energy through the air that you can't see. But we can light up this fluorescent tube. Do I have a volunteer for this? Come on down here. Don't hurt yourself. That's my job. Now hold it down at the metal. And I promise, your name is? KV. KV? KV, cool. So you're going to hold on to this. I'm going to Tesla, turn on the Tesla coil. You won't feel a thing, but even if you do, as I've been telling everyone, not only do I know adult CPR, but I know child CPR too. <laughs> so just stay there. No, that's good enough. We want to transmit. You can step back a few feet. We want to transmit a distance. OK, let's try her this time. Thank you, KB. You feeling OK? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I just heard some really loud, crazy noise. Did I miss anything cool? Just our little discussion of communication and physics. Oh, would that help me find the Wizard of Whisk? Hmm. Oh, yeah. I know. The Wizard of Whisk, he's an amateur radio operator. We just happen to have an amateur radio. No, just a radio here. So if you hold on to this, I will try to find out his call number and send out a signal with radio waves and see if we can communicate with him. Let's go. There we are. Whiskey 9 Alpha Victor. Whiskey 9 Alpha Victor. Are you out there? Are you out there? No, I guess not. But if you see a house with a really tall antenna outside, you just might find the Wizard of Whisk inside. OK, I'll keep an eye out. Thank you. Good luck. Oh, I'm sorry. I looked all over the building and I couldn't find Professor Winokur. Well, you know, when we talk about the military, that's not something you normally think about when we talk about physics. But, you know, being an old Navy sailor, I knew how important physics is to keep my 100,000 ton aircraft carrier afloat. And here to tell us more about military and the physics is our own general of relativity, Blaine Law. <laughs> Thank you, sailor. How you folks doing today? Seems my recruits look younger and younger every year. This fella right here is about as small as a frog hair split three ways and sanded smooth. Well, I've been tasked with coming here today and talking to you all about how physics has influenced the military over the years. A bunch of eggheads and lab coats have been making my job much easier, and we're pretty appreciative of that. And one of the first ways that physics helped in the field of military science was in the development of something known as ballistics, or the way that projectiles travel. 
You imagine a few thousand years ago, some caveman picked up a rock and he chucked it. He thought that was pretty neat. I wonder what happens if I threw it a little bit harder. So we tried that too, and he noticed it went a little bit further. Well, this is what's called experimental science. He made an idea, he checked it out, saw what happened, and eventually, through trial and error, he got pretty good at chucking rocks. Well, a little while later, somebody came up with a bow and arrow, right? And they found out an arrow travels a lot like a thrown rock, just goes a lot further. But it still took a lot of trial and error before they could get pretty accurate with it. Well, this idea doesn't really work so well nowadays. We only watch 80-pound ordnance a couple miles downfield where we got friendly forces nearby. We can't really be guessing and checking much. So luckily, in the late 1600s, this feller named Sir Isaac Newton comes along. He developed a cure for projectile dysfunction. We've been launching stuff ever since. It's been wonderful. To kind of demonstrate to y'all how this works and our mastery over it, I'm going to be firing a small cannon at a moving target. Now, I'm going to be firing the cannon, so I need a volunteer. And I appreciate everybody's willingness, and I know if I point a cannon at the audience, many of you would be great moving. Uh, you're really excited, aren't you? <laughs> Headquarters said I can't recruit any of y'all for this, but that's all right. We have a detainee that has offered his services. It's a little flying monkey we caught sneaking around in here earlier this morning, just looking for some army secrets, I'm guessing. Looked about as obvious as a cat trying to cover its poop on a marble floor. <laughs> We're going to stick him up right here. Oh, he's feisty. He don't want to stay. We're going to put him up here on this ledge, and I'm going to get my cannon zeroed in on him. The troublemaker all the way. Now, before we can proceed with this experiment, pursuant to uh, Wisconsin state law, university guidelines, and Army Statute 3.14, we have to have the explicit consent of any and all willing research participants. He may seem less than willing, but we're going to give him the opportunity to defend himself. So, Mr. Monkey, do you object to us firing a cannon at you? Did y'all hear anything? About as quiet as a dribble fart, wasn't he? Well, he's still looking pretty nervous. I'm afraid he's going to keep jumping off of there. He looks like a cat in a room full of rocking chairs, so... Hopefully, he'll stay tight just long enough. I got this zeroed in on him pretty well, but... Well, I'm pretty sure when this cannon goes off, he's going to jump down again. Do y'all think... If I fire this and he's moving down, is it going to go over him or under him? Over. Who thinks over? And who thinks under? Well, let's find out. Let's do our own experiment. Here we go. Fire the hole. Right in the nose. Fine. Fine. I'll get you and your little military secrets, too. I got Big Bertha here. I know you guys have been eyeballing this since the show started. I'm going to show you how cannons work. Now, a cannon has three main components. A hammer is generally not one of them, but you never know. The three main parts are the cannon or the artillery itself. And this is the thing that's a general constant. We don't want it going anywhere. We have some kind of projectile, and this is the, way, the thing we want as far away from us as we can get it. And we need something that's going to give us kind of a reaction or something that's going to propel it. Now, what do you think we guys normally use in uh, cannons and artillery to make a boom? Gunpowder, that's right. They don't trust me with gunpowder after the show back in 08. You all saw Pete with that beard? He's pretty sore when he lost it that year, but... <laughs> what they do trust me with is liquid nitrogen. You all ever seen this before? Yeah. Pretty fun stuff, isn't it? Now, the neat thing about nitrogen is, at room temperature, it likes to be a gas. But when we make it as cold as a well digger's behind in January, it condenses itself down into a liquid. Now, I'm going to pour this into the cannon, and the cannon's already at room temperature. So you see all that smoke coming up off of there? Yeah. That's the nitrogen turning back into gas. As it transforms itself from a liquid into a gas, it expands. It takes up more space. Well, we have a finite space here in this cannon shell, so what do you think's going to happen when I plug that sucker up? Something really cool, right? Your parents will thank me if I tell you not to do this at home in your backyards. <laughs> Wait till you get to university, study physics, and you can spend the rest of your life blowing stuff up. Ah, fire one ready, Gridley. Roger that. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Just like in rehearsal. He's gotten pretty good at catching those since that beard incident. <laughs> Did y'all notice anything funny about this cannon when it went off? 
That's right, it went backwards. Recoil. Watch your feet there. Why do y'all suppose that happened? Newton's law, that's right, I heard somebody say it. Y'all learned from that line man earlier that for every force, there's an equal and opposed force, right? So the same pressure that's building up and forces that plug forward, is also trying to force our cannon backward. The cannon didn't roll nearly as far as that plug went. Why is that? Shout it out. Less mass. Less mass, that's right. Actually, the cannon has more mass, so the same force acting on it won't move it quite as far as the plug moved. Think about that the next time you're driving down the freeway and you splatter a bug on your windshield. The bug's applying the same force to your car, but your car's a little bit more massive, so it gets the better end of that deal. What do you think you're doing in here, lady? We've got live ordinance going off. Oh, um, I don't know. I think I'm a little lost. I'm looking for the Wizard of Whisk. I'm trying to get to the city of green and gold. I know the wizard. He was a major in ROTC when he was back in high school. You see him sharpening his sword here. They hadn't invented guns, Ben, but... <laughs> now, I know I got a cannon big enough to launch it straight to the city of green and gold, but pursuant to university policy, state law, and Army Statute 3.14, I'm going to need you to sign some waivers for me. You know, that's okay. I think I'm just going to wait right here. I'll be right back. No. How many of you have ever had an x-ray? How about an MRI? How about a CAT scan? No, not the kind with the furry tail and all the fur on it. But uh, you know, medicine is an area that has been greatly influenced by our physics research. Uh, in fact, John Cameron, one of our professors here at the UW-Madison, was the founder of one of the very first ever medical physics departments. And here to tell us more about medicine and physics is our own Madame Curie of physics, Amy Lowitz. Hey, everyone. So I've been doing some research for the wizard, studying all the different ways that physics has contributed to the field of medicine, helping doctors learn how to diagnose and treat patients. And a great example of one of the ways that physics plays into medicine is waves. Now, waves come into medicine in all sorts of different ways, but one of the ways that you probably experience the most in your everyday life is sound. Now, the way that you hear is that waves travel through the air and into your ears, and that's what allows you to hear. A typical young adult can hear frequencies from about 20 hertz to about 20,000 hertz. That's 20,000 waves hitting your ears every second. Now, I'd like to do a little experiment to explore that a little more. So I'd like everyone in the audience to raise their hands. And I'm going to play a tone. And I'd like you to keep your hand raised until you can't hear the tone anymore. So once you can't hear it anymore, then lower your hand. So let's give it a try and see what happens. Look at that. Now, what you may have noticed is that for many of you, your parents lowered their hands before you did. That's because as we age, most humans lose their ability to hear the highest frequency sounds. But that doesn't mean there's not a sound. It just means that it's at a frequency that you can't hear it. Can anyone think of an example of something that makes a sound that you can't hear? Anybody? Just call it out. What are some examples? That's right, a dog whistle is a great example. And I just happen to have one right here. So let's give it a try. There goes Toto. Now, waves aren't just for sound. Waves can do work, too. And one way that you can demonstrate that is with an ultrasonic washer like I have here. Normally, ultrasonic washers are used for cleaning delicate instruments. And the way they work is that they vibrate back and forth very fast at such a high frequency that you can't hear it. But that helps remove particles from delicate instruments. But today, I'm going to use this ultrasonic washer to show you how waves can do work. And to help me, I have this bottle of soda water. Now, some of you probably have experience 
uh, shaking a bottle of soda water and then opening it and having it explode. This is going to do the same thing, but faster. So I'm going to open my soda water very carefully. And I have a special cap with a small hole drilled in the center. So I'm going to put my special cap on the soda water, place it in the ultrasonic washer, and let's see what happens when I turn it on. So that's pretty cool, but not that useful. But waste can do useful things, too, in medicine. And one of the best examples of that is medical imaging. That's x-rays, ultrasounds, MRIs. All of those are examples of medical imaging. The way ultrasounds work is that they use sound waves that are, again, too high frequency for you to hear. And those waves pass through the body. And any time they go from a medium that's higher density to a medium that's lower density, or vice versa, the wavelength changes. And that change in wavelength shows up as a color difference on the ultrasound picture. But I can show you that wavelength change using this wavetable that I have here. So as I send waves traveling down the wavetable, you can see that as they travel from the wide part of the wavetable near me to the narrow part of the wavetable at the other end, the wavelength gets much longer when it makes that transition. That change in wavelength would show up on an ultrasound as a color change. But I'll get back to more on that in a few minutes. <clears throat> oh, hello there. Hello, um, my name's Melissa, and I've been looking for the Wizard of Whisk forever. Could you possibly help me? Hmm, I might be able to help you with that. Oh. You see, I happen to have a key to the wizard's house, but I forgot where I put it. Oh. I know it's in one of these blocks of cheese, but I can't remember which one. Maybe we can use medical imaging to help us. OK. Let's start with the x-ray machine. So this apparatus that I have here is an x-ray machine. And the way x-rays work is that x-rays are made up of photons, which is the same stuff that makes up the light coming out of the ceiling lights, but at a higher frequency so you can't see it with your eyes. But just like the ceiling lights make shadows with the objects in the room, if there's anything inside this block of cheese, it'll make a shadow on the x-ray screen, and we'll be able to see it. So let's give it a try and see if we can see anything. I'll place the cheese inside the x-ray machine and close the door. And then I'll turn it on, and let's see what happens. <laughs> Uh-oh. That looks like a mouse. That's not what we were looking for. Hmm. Well, it definitely wasn't in that block of cheese. Let's try the other block of cheese. And this time, let's try the ultrasound. Hmm. Okay. So like we talked about before, color changes on an ultrasound represent a change in density. So if there's anything inside this block of cheese, it should show up as a color change on the ultrasound. And the way it works is that I have my ultrasound probe right here. This is where the sound waves come out of. And I'll use a special gel that will help conduct the sound waves from the probe into the cheese. So I'll apply a little bit of my special gel and spread it out with my finger. And let's see if we can see anything. All right. Well, it's a little hard to tell, but you can see that white line kind of through the center of the image there. Looks like there might be something in there. So let's see if we can find anything. Hmm. Looks like a key. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the key to the wizard's house. I know he's been experimenting with ways to transport his body across empty space. I think his lab is just ahead. Transport his body across empty space? Oh, boy. <laughs> the wizard, the wizard, the great and powerful wizard of whisk. I can make myself disappear. And I can make myself reappear. And who are you? Um, my name's Melissa, and I'm trying to get home to Chicago. 
Why, that's no problem. I've been to Chicago many times. I can easily take you there. But with your knowledge of physics, you should be able to get there all by yourself. Wait a second. You're Professor Sprott, aren't you? Pay no attention to the man in the box. You were using this piece of glass to reflect your image. That's right. This is called the Pepper's Ghost Illusion, and magicians often use this. Magicians use many principles of physics, and I hope we've convinced you today that physics is all around you, and you're using it every day. Now, I'd like to do one last demonstration for you, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge Professor Jim Latimer, who, in collaboration with Frank Ferriano, has written yet another version of the Wonders of Physics theme music. Runs about three minutes, and we will play it in its entirety at the end of the show. Now, we began by making for you a tornado, and I'd like to end by making a cloud. And we do that using some of this liquid nitrogen that we've used in earlier demonstrations, except here I have a very large container of it, 25 liters of this very cold liquid. Now, nitrogen is normally a gas. You're breathing nitrogen right now. About 80% of the air you're breathing is nitrogen. If you cool it to 321 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, 196 below zero Celsius, uh, it becomes a liquid. Um, if we force nitrogen gas into this container, that will force the liquid up into this pipe. The pipe has several dozen small holes on the top. The liquid nitrogen will come out still very, very cold. It will cool the air, and that will cause the water vapor in the air to condense into tiny droplets of liquid water. And that's what we call a cloud. And so with that, I thank you all for coming.